Hi, and welcome to another Fizz 1011 video. My name's Dr. Kevin Pimblett, and as usual, I'm joined this morning by Dr. Pim Tim Peterson. Hi, Tim. G'day. Um, Tim, here we are in the um, eatery on the first floor of the Student Centre, and thanks for shoving me along there on the sofa. No worries, any time. I'm a little concerned though, mate. Uh, I don't want students actually shoving each other on the sofas like the chariots or chargers. Yeah, we don't want to be responsible for that kind of activity. I'm not responsible. Tim pushed me. He forced me into it. It's his fault. Okay. It's all yours. All right. So this morning what we want to talk about is something called dimensional analysis. You'll see this in your textbook. It's one of the earlier chapters in the textbook. But it's a topic that we're not actually going to cover directly in class. But Tim and I both feel it's worthwhile telling you a little bit about it for your own background in physics. So let's kick off, Tim. Let me ask you, what is a dimension? Yeah, a dimension refers to uh, some quantity in the universe that uh, extends some measurement of that quantity. So, for example, uh, mass is a dimension. How does a dimension like mass, how is that different from kilograms? Yeah, so when we say dimension, we're referring to the quantity itself and not the units in which it's measured. So, grams and kilograms uh, the units of mass, but mass itself is the dimension. So even solar mass is, is a unit rather than yes, a dimension. That's right, and you can invent your own units if you like. Um, there Go are ahead. standards for that. <laughs> um, dimensions uh, can be quite interesting in other fields. For example, photography. Um, you can have color spaces of hue, saturation, and brightness. So hue is one dimension, saturation is another, and brightness is another. And you know what? Astronomical units, astronomers don't even like using SI units. We invent our own, such as astronomical units, solar masses, parsecs, and so on. These have all got dimensions that are comparable to SI units. Yeah, yeah there are lots of different standards for units, um, but dimensional analysis lets you um, combine them all together and convert between them. And it's something we do all the time when we're, say, checking equations to see if they're right or wrong. We can just first check the dimension. So before we get to having a look at a few equations, how many dimensions are there? Well, uh, at the risk of forgetting some of them, we have <laughs> mass, we have length, we have time, we have amperes for electrical current, and candela, I think you Candela, that's an SI unit. I've yeah. forgotten about that one. Yeah. What and else? temperature, Temperature. Kelvin. Kelvin. Yep. Yeah. And moles as well, Tim. Ah, yes. Uh, okay, so soon we're going to go to a board and write down some equations. And the purpose of that will be to show how you can use dimensional analysis to check equations, to make sure the dimensions are correct on both sides of an equation. That sounds like a straightforward sort of thing to do. What's the benefit of doing that? The benefit is that y you can determine whether your equation is right or wrong. You, know, you might be in an exam and you've memorized a couple of formulas and you ha your memory hasn't worked that well and it gives you a simple and quick way to check that you've got the right formula and it makes sense. I heard it was also a good way to cheat. Yes, uh, you, you, in a sense you can guess some equations, equations in nature. You can come up with them out of thin air using dimensions alone in, in favourable cases. All right, shall we demonstrate a couple of favourable cases over at the board? Okay. All right. Okay, so one of the easiest equations we could consider is force is the negative of k times displacement x. This is simply Hooke's law, and I use the word simple there because it's got a linear relationship. There's no quadratics, there's no imaginary numbers or any of that jazz. Um, so let's have a look at the dimensions of this. Tell you what, I'll do the easy one first. Okay. So, let me do x displacement. We know that's got dimensions of length l. And I'm going to put that in square brackets to simply denote that this is a dimension. It's not an SI unit like meters, and it's not indeed a barbaric unit like astronomical units, but it does have dimensions of l. I'll let you do force f, maybe. OK, let me have a, a go at that. Well, we know force is mass times acceleration. That's one of Newton's laws. F equals ma. Mm. And we also know that acceleration doesn't involve mass. So I'll do the mass bit first. Let's okay. decompose the force into dimensions of mass. Mass. OK, F equals ma. So now you've got to do the a bit. Yeah, so now what is acceleration? It's the time rate change of velocity. So that's d velocity by d time. That's right. 
And what is velocity? It's the time rate change of displacement. D position by D time. Okay, so I only really heard position once there uh, from Kevin, so I'm going to put down length like that. Mm. Um, but I heard D time twice. So um, per unit time, per unit time would be the dimensions of time to the negative two. So now we can start thinking about the dimensions of k up yes. at the top, the proportionality constant. And so this is actually just like doing an equation, really. We could immediately cross out uh, the l's, because we've got l on the left and l on the right. Yeah, we can figure it out, because I, I personally don't remember what the dimensions of that are. No, I don't either, to be honest. It's not something I've memorized. Mm. Well, let's go on. Let's figure it out. So you mentioned crossing out length because it's on both sides of the equation. And I think that's all we have to that's do. That's it. It's fairly simple. So the dimensions of k are mass and time to the minus 2. Sounds about right. Sounds right, yeah. Well, there's nothing else it could be, really, looking at this relationship. Should we have a think about a little harder problem? Hmm. OK, now we're going to look at one of the ways in which you can use dimensional analysis to try and, say, guess the laws of nature. Guess the laws of nature? Sounds a bit uh, risky. Yeah, uh, well, maybe we should say uh, second guessing. Second the guessing of the laws of nature. All right, so what are we going to do? Uh, we're going to look at the period of a pendulum. So a pendulum is a thing that has an arm and a mass attached to the end, and it oscillates backwards and forwards. Well, to be honest, I can't remember the equation for an pendulum. Uh, I used to a few years ago, but my memory seems to get worse as I get older. I can't but remember either. OK, so can we use a bit of intuition here? What do we think it's going to be proportional to? Yeah, so uh, perhaps length is involved, the length of the arm. OK, so let me write this up. So period T is, well, it's not equal to. I'll rip that out and put proportional to the length of the arm L. What else? Uh, mass of mass, yeah, the sounds bulb. good. Mass of the blob on the end. Mm. And what else? Maybe gravity. Else? Gravity. Okay, so we'll put little g in there. The acceleration at Earth's surface. Should we do a bit of dimensional analysis? So we'll take this down a line. So we know time has dimensions of t time, and that's going to be proportional to l. That's got dimensions of length. Proportional to mass. Mass has got dimensions of mass m, and little g, well, that's, that's an acceleration. Mm. We just had that a little while ago, and that's l t to the minus 2. Those are the dimensions of little g. Mm. So we can use this now to presumably get a hold of the exactly what proportionality it is. Yeah, and we know something's wrong straight away, because we can see that the units don't balance over here. So they there must be something wrong with these dimensions. Perhaps the powers are wrong. OK, so why don't we stick some powers on these? Let's call them alpha, beta, gamma for the, for the sake of argument, maybe. OK, I'll write those on. Sure. Because I've got the blue pen. OK, so all we've done there is simply say that we know the left-hand side doesn't balance with the right-hand side, but we're going to put some exponents on the right-hand side and try and figure out what alpha, beta, and gamma are. Hmm. How do we do that? Oh, let's have a go. Um, so I'll do the easy one first. Uh, there's no uh, mass over here, hmm. and there's only one occurrence of mass here, so beta must be zero. OK, I, I'd agree with that. So the period of a pendulum does not depend upon mass in the slightest. So we've mm. used our intuition. We said it might be something to do with mass. We were wrong. My we couldn't remember feeling. the equation. My uh, gut feeling was wrong. Too. Your gut feeling mm. was wrong, absolutely. Mm. Beta is 0. All right, so what else have we got? OK, so let's uh, collect these exponents on L. So we've got L to the power of alpha plus gamma. So alpha, we've got 1 in there. Gamma, we've got 1 in there. Mm. But really, on the left-hand side, all we've got is t time. And all that's involved with is gamma. Yeah, so there's no length over here. And what that tells us is that alpha plus gamma must be equal to 0. OK, so alpha plus gamma is 0 because we haven't got length on the other side. But we've got t. 
Mm, so let's do that one. Okay. It's kind of the obvious one since we have time over there. It looks like we're getting a few simultaneous equations here. Mm. Uh, so what will we have for t? We've got t to the negative 2 gamma. Yep. And over here we've got t, t to, to the, the 1. Yeah, so what we know is that negative 2 gamma equals 1. Okay, well that's straightforward then. Gamma is negative a half. Okay, let's write that. And then we can plug back in for gamma in this other equation up here to make sure that that equals zero, just as this equation dictates. So if gamma is negative a half, alpha must necessarily be one half. I think we have everything we need to solve the problem now. I think we do. So um, let's plug it back in then. So L, we've got alpha being, let's rub that out. Where's alpha? Alpha is one half. Beta is zero. And gamma uh, is negative one half. So we know we've got something like a square root. So maybe we can write down over on this side of the board time t equals, let's see, what does it equal? We've got length, so L to the one half, and we've also got this term, which is G, to the negative one half. We can simplify that. Mm. Let's put a square root in. So we've got something like L over G. And I probably shouldn't have put an equal sign. That probably should be a proportional to sign, if I'm honest. Hmm. So it could be equal. It could we, be equal. We just don't know. We just don't know if there's a proportionality constant. And of course, proportionality constants are dimensionless. Hmm. There could be a pi, there could be a 10,000 in front of that square root. Who knows? We don't hmm. know until we figure out what the proportionality is. But there's our final answer. Time of the pendulum is proportional to the square root L over G. And the, the amazing thing is that this formula turns out to be correct. It's an approximation for when the pendulum uh, has small swings. Large swings, it doesn't work. But it, it's actually correct. OK, I think that's uh, good enough for today's little video. And thank you very much for your time, as always, Tim. Thank you, Kevin. And we'll see you next time.